Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your second part of test number 9 that we are going to discuss in today's video. Now, uh, so far, if you have not yet checked out the test series because the UPSC prelims exam is coming up and it's less than 50 days now. So really to boost up your uh, UPSC score, uh, I really recommend you guys to check out the test series which is available at 499 on the platform of PMF IS that comprises of 1000 high quality MCQs. If you really want to check out the test series at discounted prices, do check out the link given in description below. So the very uh, first question that we are going to discuss in today's video is question number 21. Very simple, very straightforward question, simple concept. The term called the crossing the floor. What does this term refers to? So one thing is clear that we uh, like, you know, if you consider all the options, the word crossing the floor has its relation to the political system of the country. But what exactly is this? Is it about the process of passing the legislation or is it about any politician going against the party and giving the votes, indicate practice of forming the coalition government and also the motion passed when defection happens. Very logically, I mean, forget about all the, de uh, you know, specific details and everything. Apply your common sense. What could be the possible meaning of crossing the floor? If you are supposed to stand at this point and you are actually going to the other direction, that is the meaning that you are crossing the floor, right? So even considering that it has a relation with option number B in polity, that crossing the floor means if any politician is going to uh, going against its party lines and voting against what the normal party has uh, or is, is intended to vote. So that is the meaning of crossing the floor. We'll come back on the level of difficulty, but first understand the meaning is very important guys. So basically what happens for any question that we want to decide in the parliament, uh, voting is must. And when, whenever any uh, MP or, a, or MLA is supposed to vote, parliamentary parties usually vote as a team. I mean, there is there is a uh, there is a party whip that issue that is issued to all the MPs or MLAs, and it is made very clear by the party uh, you know management that you are supposed to say yes or no on this particular thing, where all party members are going to vote in the same way because they are collectively voting uh, as a party. But sometimes, sometimes what happens if any member of parliamentary party goes against those party directions, if the party is saying yes on that topic and he, is, he says I'm, I'm with no and that way if he's, cross, if he's actually um, uh, you know, crossing the floor means he's voting against the party lines. So member of parliamentary party, though it rarely happens, but it, it do happens. Because you understand, if you are voting against your party, that simply means you are you are not, there is a question mark on the loyalty of yours for your party. And crossing the floor simply shows the disagreement within the party. And a member who does that is considered to be traitor of the party. And that's why this is a very uh, sensitive topic which, which we are talking about. So, the right option that is in front of you, so crossing the floor is option number B. Otherwise also if you if you look at the other options, so it is very obvious that crossing the floor absolutely has nothing to do with coalition government. It is nothing to do with passing legislation or nothing to do with defection. Defection can be a case, can be a case because if somebody crosses the floor, there is a chances, there are chances that some disciplinary action can be taken if the, if the party demands such action against uh, uh, his own MP, so somebody who has crossed the floor. So in that particular case, the defection charges can happen, but that's a, that's a later stage. This is considered to be action of indiscipline. And based on that, defection cases can be uh, held, but not initially. The meaning is not related to defection. Defection is, you can say, it's a consequence of this particular act. So clearly not this way. Very easy, simple, straightforward question without any issue, guys. And simply by understanding the meaning, this can be solved as well. Next question again is in from the polity. The question is, with reference to vote from home facility, 
vote from home facility the name says everything you are not you are not uh, going to go to the to the you know voting uh, centers you can simply register your vote from your home but think about it for which of these following the government could have thought about vote from home that makes sense no but it cannot be for the first time voter first time voters are quite young people you are a first time voter you are all 18 plus so why government will give you vote from home facility where you are young enough to go and go to the normal uh, booth polling booth and you can register so obviously one cannot one make no sense so understand from this perspective if government is giving this vote from home facility there are certain conditions applied and there are some specific sections for whom this kind of facility is made and election commission of india for the first time in the history of lok sabha election now the election commission of india has extended the vote from home facility to the person with disability and senior citizens aged 85 and above very interestingly so if there is anybody who is physically challenged physically disabled so he or she need not to go to uh, to the polling booth you can give your vote by sitting at your home but of course there is a process behind it and for the first time if you are a senior citizen 85 or above age also con <coughs> considering your age you are not you are not uh, uh, able to go to the polling booth but the point here is why we are including these people because they are citizens of india and they have every right to cast their vote casting vote is one of the most important thing in uh, in uh, democracy you know so as to make sure that every person votes count to make sure that the voting turnout comes out to be huge that's why these kind of things are uh, done by the election commission of india now please understand not just these two categories there is a whole list of members or eligible uh, you know people who come under this vote from home facility so number one i told you any any old age people 85 or above year of age are eligible for it person with disability even media persons because you know media persons are always they, they may not be able to cast their vote because they are busy uh, you know covering covering the poll activities they are busy reporting so even media persons can opt this facility also the workers from essential services for example if you are an employee working in a metro railway or healthcare and you are because you are engaged you have some priorities and you are not able to you are not getting the time to go and cast the vote because you are already into essential services and you are not getting off uh, for that particular day so then also you can opt for vote from home facilities and even the service water service water means the armed forces personnel you are you are at your at border you are not able to make up to the town your hometown and cast their vote so even even for armed uh, pers armed forces personnel even the central armed police forces who are deployed away from the home they are they can also opt for these kind of facilities so now if you look at the question so clearly barring the exception of one and two obviously 60 year is too young comparatively it is 85 and above so who are eligible sir the number two and number three are eligible only two very easy very logically you could have solved it understanding that who should be given the vote from home facility i mean of, of course some people may find 60 because 60 in our head 60 is retirement age so 60 onwards old age starts but for vote from home the criteria is 85 or above right so that is the case so be careful with the last statement otherwise things are pretty simple now a very interestingly what is the procedure how do we how do this vote from home facility works all you need to do like if there is anybody who is in who is eligible for vote from home facility they simply have to download the form 12d now please remember you may have this question coming as an mcq as well that recently form 12d was in news relates to which of the following so you can say sir 12d relates to vote from home facility file applic uh, like okay so now first you have downloaded this form it is available on the election commission of india website uh, once you download that so you have to file the application within five days of the elections you have to uh, file the application to the district election commissioner office then once you get the permission you you are approved for vote from home uh, facility 
then the two polling officials one videographer and a security person will come to your house so that you can register your vote there's a process uh, if by chance you are not available at your home at that time the team will come one more so there are there they, they will attempt two visits if by chance you are not available all, uh, both times then you will not be able to either cast your vote from home or also from the EVM both facilities are going to be stopped for you so there is a process behind it how, to, how it is to be done question number 23 the question 23 is with respect to HB1AC test now very interestingly guys it's a very very famous very popular test to, to conduct which is conducted to diagnose which are the following disease straight away answer it is diabetes for the diabetes it's one of the most important test where by this test you actually get an average of the of the sugar level of the diabetes level uh, uh, in your body the average is of last three months and so far this is the most reliable test uh, you know to actually get the status of your diabetes so the it's a very easy straightforward question without any trouble just to give you a little bit more information about the uh, so-called HbA1c test, uh, the HbA1c test is also called as hemoglobin A1 AIC test or A1 test. That's that's the uh, other name for the for the test, and it's a widely used uh, uh, test for diagnosing the pre-diabetes as well as diabetes, both type one, type two. Type one is more dangerous, by the way. So type two is more common. Type 2 diabetes is more common uh, in India and in general also. Type 2 is your blood sugar. Uh, type 1 is problematic. So type 2 is like your body is not able to produce enough insulin. But once you, you are able to get external insulins, your body can utilize that. Type 1 problem is your body has completely stopped producing the uh, insulin and your, your body is not able to respond to the insulin. So this type 1 condition is more more dangerous. If you uh, compare the two, it's more dangerous. Okay, so simple. It's the the process is very simple. How do you detect diabetes uh, in your blood? So very simple process. So uh, guys, whatever we eat, whenever we eat, the sugar from our food goes straight away to the blood to the bloodstream, and the sugar that goes to the bloodstream called glucose. That then this glucose attaches to the hemoglobin in our red blood corpuscles or RBCs. So what happens? So basically every time some sugar is attached to the hemoglobin people with pre-diabetes and diabetes they have more sugar attached comparatively to the non-diabetic person so when you when you conduct this particular test basically what 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 is it measuring once you conduct this test why hb is taken as a sample because all the blood sugar all the sugar that you have eaten eaten in one form or the other that is stuck to your rbc and then we calculate the percentage of the rbc that is having those kind of sugar coated kind of thing and based on that we we get to know if a person is non diabetic or pre diabetic or properly diabetic next question number 24 again very simple question with respect to parliamentary privileges now two three condition now two three points you need to understand so parliamentary privileges is probably one of the most important topic and very common topic that you must have read in your polity syllabus right we know that parliamentary privileges are special rights, immunities, ex exemptions enjoyed by two houses of the parliament, the committees and the members. Yes, absolutely. We know about the parliamentary privileges and it is given to every member. Every member of parliament gets that. That is obviously. But please just apply your logic. I'm, I, I'll get to the detail later. Apply your logic. If as a member of parliament you are getting some privileges, okay fine we understand that you are going to get exemption from any civil liability on you. If you have said something, if you, if you have conduct, if you have uh, used your uh, position in certain way, I, I mean any civil, any civil, uh, you know, liability, any civil, civil uh, law that you have broke, let's say, you are still going to get some immunity because you are a member of parliament but in any case just imagine and apply your common sense do you think for any criminal activity you can ever get a privilege no if you are a member of parliament you have murdered someone and you can say okay sir nothing can happen to me because i'm a member of parliament criminal activity cannot be exempted at any case there's no sense why any criminal activity 
you are not going to get prosecuted just because you are a member of parliament. So civil liabilities we understand, but not the criminal. Criminal cannot be in any, any case. So this has to go wrong. This has to be wrong. That, that is very important. So this is a one, one common thing that you need to keep in your mind. Now if I get into the detail guys, very interestingly, if somebody has to define what parliamentary privileges are, so I told you what they, what they exactly are. And it is clearly mentioned, these privileges are mentioned in Article 105 of Indian Constitution. Though please understand, Parliament has not made any particular law to codify these privileges. But right now, there are five sources on which we consider or, or the sources are there on which from where we have derived the so-called parliamentary privileges. Some are constitutional provisions like for example this one. Some are the laws made by the parliament, some are the rules of the both houses, Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, some from some parliamentary conventions or some judicial interpretations. You may have this one MCQ as a standalone one also. You may, you may have this question which of the following are considered to be sources of parliamentary privileges, then you must keep these five things in your head. That is, that is okay. And I, like I told you guys that they are never ever going to get uh, exemption for the criminal activity. Privileges are only for the civil liability means for example, if you are a member of parliament and you have made any statement or you have done anything in the course of your duty, something of civil nature, then you will get some exemption, some relief, not, not for the criminal one. And also do remember one very interesting thing that these parliamentary privileges are exclusively, exclusively for the member of parliament which are actually the real um, MPs, but also, also to those people who are entitled to speak if it is required, if there is some situation arises and there are some people who are allowed to be, uh, to take part in the proceeding of the house. For example, Attorney General of India, he is not a member of parliament. He is not a member of parliament, but sometimes it is required that Attorney General of India is sometimes called upon and he is entitled to speak and take proceedings. In that case, when he is into that particular role, even that person is going to get the par same parliamentary privileges. Very, very important. Parliamentary privileges do not extend to the president. For president, there is separate article 361 uh, where the, uh, the privileges are given. Why I am telling you this? Because see, president is considered to be part of parliament. He is part of parliament. No. So whenever I use the word parliament, it means Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha plus president. So he is part of the president, but not a member of parliament. He is not an MP. That, that, that is the case. But for, and, he's, and he does not, doesn't even come under this one particular category. So be careful with small, small details that you need to take care. So here guys, very, very importantly. So first and third are correct. Second being wrong. How many statements are correct? Only two. I think very easy, very straightforward question without any trouble. In fact, uh, these 20 questions that we are going to discuss today are mostly not very difficult one. Brings us to the next question number 25, holistic progress card, straightforward, holistic progress card introduced by the NCERT, National Council for Educational Research Training. So NCERT has recently come out with this new sort of idea of holistic progress card. Very easy, straightforward, could have been attempted. Now, what is this holistic uh, report card or progress card? We'll talk about it. So, NCRT has recently introduced this uh, HPC, the holistic progress card. What exactly this is? So, normally you know, you and uh, I can relate that in our times of school, uh, in our school times, there is always pressure of getting marks, marks, percentage and all. Then uh, the generations after us, they were more into getting the grades, right? But now NCRT has started a new system of evaluating the performance uh, of a child. So I can say the, hol the word holistic means not just academics. It includes many more things. The word holistic means more comprehensive. So basically this holistic progress card, it's a new form of evaluation of a student based on the recommendations of the National Education Policy 2020. So this, this HPC is one of the part of new, new, uh, the new ed National Education Policy. So this particular card doesn't depend only on the marks on academic performance. 
because and it's a very logical thing i mean you can't simply uh, say if a if a child is has a bright future or not based on the academics academic is one such part maybe that person is very good with arts maybe very good with uh, with sports or has at least ha is a is a well mannered person so at least he should be getting some uh, you know some evaluation based on the other parameters as well so instead of only focusing on the marks the holistic a uh, progress card actually includes the feedback from the parents feedback from the peers self assessment by the students so that they can monitor their holistic development on a regular basis so basically what it will measure the holistic progress card is going to measure academic performance obviously but apart from that a child's progress in interpersonal relationship self reflection creativity emotional application in classroom everything is going to be part of evaluation and that actually going to ease out the pressure on the children which are, which is which is every time high based on the academic performance and for for that particular kind of uh, thing for this hpc and all so government has got a standard setting body under ncert called parak parak is performance assessment review analysis of knowledge for holistic development so hpc is to be done by a body called parak under ncert so please remember these two things very very closely and this is absolutely important and very much required considering the kind of pressure the students are facing these days brings us to the next question on tuberculosis tb very simple straightforward question it's a bacterial infection yes sir affect the lungs absolutely india has a huge burden india has more than 1/4 of total global cases india has 27% of the total tb cases are in india that's why india is called the the tuberculosis capital of the world the tb capital of the world because global out of the global one 27% cases are in india the united nation aim un aims to end tb by 2030 absolutely but at our national level at our national level we have got we have set the target to eliminate tb by 2025 so our national target is 2025 global target Uh, under the sustainable development goals is 2030 so abs i don't see any problem very easy very straightforward question uh, answer is 1 2 3 and tb is something we all are discussing from ages no we know about it so what it's a bacterial infection caused by caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis that is the name of bacteria that mainly affects the lung and causes tuberculosis tb affects the lungs uh, that kind of tb is called the pulmonary tb but not but it's a common myth that tb is just restricted to the lungs that is not the case in fact there are so many cases where tb is affecting not just the lungs but other parts of the body if that is the case it is going to be called as extra pulmonary tb mainly it affects the tongue, uh, lungs so if the question says that it is going to affect lungs only if that would have been the statement lungs only then clearly not because there are two type of tb pulmonary and extra pulmonary <clears throat> okay this is important so tb is a big challenge in india like i told you with 27% global burden what we are getting in fact if there is a very disturbing number that every day 3500 people die from tb worldwide and about 30000 people get infected with tb and india unfortunately bears the largest burden in fact this is the this is alarming because tb is curable disease and if there is a curable disease and still we are becoming the tb capital of the world it's a alarming situation and that's why uh, the national tb control program aims to eliminate uh, tb by 2025 but the global target the un target is still eliminate 2020 2030 for the tb epidemic Question number twenty-seven. Again, a very simple question with respect to the nominated members of Rajya Sabha. So you have some elected members, you have some nominated members, right? So in Rajya Sabha, there are almost twelve uh, nominated members, which are nominated by president. Fine, but what are the bases? I mean, some people they they are elected members. The nominated one are simply chosen by the president. But on what basis? Of course, there are some criteria. any person who is nom who is a nominated member has to be expert in the fields of art right literature science social service 
but what is this cooperative movement it is not one it is not the criteria so cooperative movement is not one of the criteria to be nominated as rajya sabha member so clearly this is wrong ha rest two are very simple we know about it that if if there is any uh, nominated member in the rajya sabha or lok sabha there are two members in the lok sabha and uh, 12 in rajya sabha so any nominated member can join a political party but there is a condition if you are a nominated member <coughs> you can join any political party but within the first 6 months of your mem- membership if you join any political party after 6 months then you will be liable then there there would there would be disciplinary action against you uh, in the anti defection case yes there would be proper and uh, there would be uh, under schedule 10 under the anti defection law there would be uh, heavy punishment and in, like you would be disqualified basically so nominated member can join political party but with the condition in the first 6 months very interestingly the nominated members are not going to vote in the election of president because for election of the president there is simple condition it says all elected members not nominated all elected members of parliament and mlas but the elected one not the nominated one they are going to vote but for the election of the vice president it says all members all members includes elected plus nominated so it says the nominated are not allowed for uh, election of president fine but for vice president they are allowed so that's why this is also wrong first wrong second wrong third is right how many statement correct only one so very easy very simply could have been attempted so there are these are very simple simple uh, things that you need to uh, that you need to consider under which particular article the president is uh, uh, has the power to nominate the members under article 80 12 members can be up, uh, nominated by president in the rajya sabha and here are the criteria so clearly the cooperative movement criteria is not there it the cooperative movement criteria is for the nomination of state legislative council the vidhan parishad not rajya sabha so l- don't get mixed with the two things it's very very important now that brings us to the next question guys and uh, the next question is question number 28 now this is a question on cervical cancer how many statements are correct that we need to see so cervical cancer is quite very very important it's it's happening here and cervical cancer is very much in the news and uh, there are lot of concerns worldwide and people are um, into the awareness campaigns with respect to the cervical cancer why because globally cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer which is there for women at a global level in fact there is a data that says 3 lakh women every year or one life every 2 minutes is lost just because of cervical cancer if you talk about india cervical cancer is the second most common cancer after the breast cancer and this is a very important fact that you need to remember for your exam we know about cervical cancers it is caused by uh, the human uh, papilloma virus the hpv virus and uh, there is there are a lot of awareness drives which are there uh, these days about the human papilloma virus and remember our uh, human papilloma virus is a dna based virus because viruses are some viruses are rna based some are dna based if by chance you ever get this question so remember the hpv virus is a dna based virus plus again even the cervical cancer is preventable it's a curable disease if it is detected early and managed effectively and lack of awareness is one such problem that we are not able to fight against it and 3 lakh women are are losing life every year guys it's a, it's a huge number now in india some ground breaking development has happened we have india this is india's first indigenously developed vaccine on cervical cancer named is sarvavac as the name says a lot sarvavac sarva is cervical cancer vac is vaccine so india's first indigenously developed quadrivalent human papilloma vaccine is there by the name sarvavac and this is a vaccine against cervical cancer right it protects from four type of hpv giving 80 per, uh, and these four types of hpv are responsible for 80% of the cervical cancer 
I'm not saying that it's going to give you 100% protection, but it's going to give you major protection from the main types of HPV. And Cervavac will be administered to the girls. It will be given to the girls, especially between 9 to 14 years of the prevalent of the of the uh, of the age to prevent the cervical cancer, because probably this particular age is the one from where the girls become really susceptible towards the cervical cancer. But please remember, everything is fine. Cervavac is a, is a ground-shaking discovery, fine. But at present, the government has not included the cervical cancer vaccine in the routine immunization package. And government has no plans to do it anytime soon. So right now, it is not part of our regular immunize, uh, immunization program or the package. So it is, still, uh, uh, it is still kept outside the purview of that. So if you look at the question, how many statements are correct, sir? So even you can say cervical cancer, most common cancer, no, it is after the breast cancer. So clearly one is not right. And simply by eliminating option number one, you are going to get the right answer. So you can solve this question both ways, by e either by eliminating or knowing every fact about it. So second statement is correct, but the third again is not correct because it says Cervavac is included in national immunization program, not yet. Maybe tomorrow, but not yet. So clearly only our option available is option two. Medium level I, I would say, but something you could have attempted because at least at least you have this uh, idea. If cervical cancer would have been the most common cancer in India, probably you would be knowing about it more. Probably you would have heard about it more. You, you live in India guys and what whatever threat threatens India, uh, we are somehow we are aware of that. We know breast cancer cases are more in India than cervical cancer. So clearly it is not, even I, if, if, if I don't know, it is the second most common cancer, but I, at least I can be sure living in India that it is not the most common for sure because I know some, something more about it, no? So that way you could have simply eliminated the options and get the right answer. Now statement number 29, uh, the, op, the question of 29, very important, key, very important uh, question and something which is there in news all the time these days. For the, for the last couple of months, every, every second, third news is all about the ED, ED. The ruling party is saying a lot of things about ED. Uh, ED is doing a lot of things uh, uh, against the opposition parties. Opposition is saying a lot of things about ED. Every time there is some question coming on the enforcement directorate. And majority of the people think that ED works under Ministry of Home Affairs. But that is not true. That is not true. So what under which Ministry Enforcement Directorate works? For that you need to understand the core principles of ED. If you understand the purpose of the ED, by default you will understand which ministry it has to be under. So please remember, few facts, let's discuss very quickly about the Enforcement Directorate. So ED is a multidisciplinary organization which has a mandate the main, the core purpose of ED is to investigate the offenses of money laundering, also to investigate any violations of the foreign exchange. So now understand, commonly understand, if there is one anybody which, ha, which is going to investigate cases of money laundering and foreign exchange laws, so clearly it is going to be under Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue is part of Ministry of Finance, very important. And I'm telling you, majority people have this confusion that it works under the home, uh, home Ministry, it doesn't. The background of the ED, if you look, it was 1956 when ED was created, established, but that time the name was Enforcement Unit. And that time it was under Department of Economic Affairs, under again the same Ministry of Finance. But later on, in 1957, next year, this Enforcement Unit was renamed as Enforcement Directorate. And then later from Department of Economic Affairs, it was shifted to Department of Revenue under Ministry of Finance. So now, if you, now you are aware of these two facts, so clearly you can say, sir, here both statements are absolutely wrong. So it was established as a statutory body, 51, 1991, absolutely not. 1956 and 57 are the two important years. 91 has nothing to do with Enforcement Directorate and Ministry is also wrong. So here, which statement is right, sir? No, uh, neither one nor two. Very easy, straightforward question without any trouble. And ED and all these important bodies which are in news, you are supposed to prepare them very, very well. Brings us to the question number 30, sir. 
again one more disease called hepatitis so what what are the uh, how many statements are correct with respect to hepatitis now which which this is our keyword but start analyzing the statements okay so every important point you need to underline that you actually have to focus while giving the answer hepatitis is inflation inflammation of the liver that can lead to liver cancer yes so we know about it hepatitis has a direct connection with the liver infection right okay now it says hepatitis b vaccine given to the babies only after 2 year old now question mark and be very focused because this is a fact that you can't guess is it after 2 years okay i need to think about it now national viral hepatitis control program launched in 2018 now it wants to eliminate hepatitis by 2025 again very big question mark so these are the few things you really have to be focusing upon so first statement looks right to me but i, ha I really have to be careful with our statement 2 and statement 3 because there are particular facts and years that are involved what how we should eliminate i'll try i'll i'll, I'll make you understand on that so basics of hepatitis is quite clear hepatitis is one such disease which relates to inflammation of the liver and this can be caused by a variety of either infectious virus or even some non infectious agents they can also cause the inflammation of the liver right now depending on what particular condition what particular type of hepatitis you are diagnosed with because sometimes the condition can be self limiting may maybe i mean it's not going to cause you bigger trouble but sometimes the hepatitis can actually spread into chronic hepatitis even leading to liver cancer or liver uh, cirrhosis there are five main strains of hepatitis virus that is hepatitis a b c d, d and e they all cause liver disease but again type b and type c are the one which are most dangerous hepatitis b and c because they are leading to chronic diseases are uh, not not as, because other a d and e are not as dangerous but b and c are the most dangerous and they are responsible for most common cause of liver cirrhosis or the liver cancers so we really have to be careful with hepatitis b and hepatitis c now to fight hepatitis b problem we have got hepatitis b or hbv vaccine in, in india and that gives us protection with respect to hepatitis b infection but when this this uh, vaccine is to be administered at the time of the birth as early as like within 24 hours you you are supposed to get this vaccine for your children so the question said that it is to be given only after 2 years clearly not as early as possible within first 24 hours your child is going to get the hepatitis b vaccine and then subsequently it has some booster doses at at 6 month 10 weeks 6 weeks 10 weeks 14 weeks there is a combination that is the other case but that is the way hepatitis b vaccine is administered as a part of immunization program of india and yes again i told you be careful about the year by when we are targeting to eliminate for for uh, uh, for eliminating the viral hepatitis the target year is 2030 for tuberculosis the target year was 2025 so don't get confused between the two for hepatitis our target year is 2020 2030 how we are going to do that how we are going to eliminate this uh, hepatitis thing so there are there are certain goals community awareness laboratory network testing surveillance baseline data you know training by doing everything we are aiming to eliminate it by 2030 if you come to the question again sir like the same things so clearly the the year is here not correct and it is and again 90% times you are seeing the statement like only all always never so be very careful with these key keywords so here also it is wrong because it is to be given to the babies within 24 hours of their birth not 2 years or old it would be really late so clearly these two are wrong only first is correct only one is the right answer medium level question you could have at least taken a risk about it because see skipping it all together make no sense so at least if, even if, if even if you are in a position to get 70% things right here you can still take a risk on that of course you really have to be careful with the with the years or the data's facts which are there but then again you can't you should not skip it all together 
question number 31 now recently few state governments banned the cotton candy it was in newspaper everywhere why some states have banned the cotton candy due to the presence of this one particular cancer causing chemical in it and what was that one particular chemical that was caused that could have been caused uh, could have been causing cancer in children and that's why the cotton candy was banned it was not uh, uh, aflatotoxins it is not benzene uh, benzene uh, dine it is option number c the rhodamine b so rhodamine b now this is a fact based questions i mean it, it was an easy one straightforward one but only if you have read about it in case you have no idea in case you have not read about it please do not take a risk in that case please skip the options if you have no idea because there is absolutely no scope of any guesswork right answer is c it's a pure fact current affair based question now why it was in news you need to learn about it now recently karnataka government banned the use of this so called rhodamine b which is basically a food coloring agent and it's commonly very popularly used in gobi manchurian and uh, cotton candy so next time if you order gobi manchurian be really careful because the restaurant may be using the so called rhodamine b and mostly lot of lot of eateries in india they use rhodamine b to make food items look really really red to impart that red color into the food the rhodamine b is used right so but but now there are studies that have shown that these artificial colors may pose long term health risk and they may be causing cancer before karnataka even tamil nadu and puducherry they too had prohibited the sale of the cotton candy with rhodamine b samples discovered and as per the food safety standard act uh, preparation packaging importing any item containing this rhodamine b in wedding ceremonies is also already a punishable offense so please next time it's not just a mcq it's it's all about the uh, uh, awareness thing also so be very very careful whenever um, any food is having this rhodamine b you are not supposed to eat but there are some permitted synthetic coloring agents which are allowed which 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 can be consumed for red color yellow color blue and green color so here is a list so these are the permitted ones like for red color the poncia 4r or the uh, caramo caramozine is there so there is a whole list so these are allowed but i would again say don't take a risk avoid artificial colors as much as can that make every sense no now question number 32 is again a very simple question guys because penicillin is something we know about penicillin may you you may be not aware about penicillin g but penicillin is something we know it's it has uh, it has connection with the vaccine penicillin is a, is a vaccine that we have been uh, hearing from ages so it is not a virus not a black hole not a invasive species it has to do something with pharmaceutical ingredient so even by recalling the uh, basic knowledge that you have because penicillin is i'm sure we we must have heard somewhere about the penicillin vaccine or penicillin uh, shot or the injection of penicillin something like that so clearly you could have eliminated the other three and the obvious choice would have been option a easy straightforward what exactly the penicillin g is all about we need to understand why it is in use we need to understand that too so now recently hyderabad based hyderabad based orvindo pharma after 30 years they have started producing the penicillin g again and this is a widely used in antibiotics so penicillin g is what exactly what is the penicillin g penicillin g is basically see every uh, medicine that you make for every medicine so if you are having some headache you take some medicine how that headache goes goes, goes away because every medicine has api like as, as a main uh, you know thing so uh, there are two components of any medicine one is api and one is the other part api the active pharmaceutical ingredient it is this particular raw material it is this particular element that that has the uh, therapeutic effect which is ultimately going to give you the required the desired purpose of medicine is served by the api 
thus, thus the major composition of API decides the medicine is going to uh, give you relief for what particular kind of condition. So, the penicillin G is this API. So, penicillin G it is an active pharmaceutical ingredient it is an it is an API and it is used the, this penicillin G as API is used in many many antibiotics. So, next time whenever the companies are going to create or manufacture the antibiotics penicillin G to be used as API and it is the main ingredient of a drug responsible for bringing out the desired effects. Like many other APIs penicillin G was phased out of production in India. Why we are starting after 30 years? Because in 1990s there used to be many companies or like most majorly there used to be 5 companies who they used to manufacture penicillin G in India. But after 1990s India stopped producing this uh, one particular API and many other uh, API as well because then there was available there was influx of cheaper Chinese products flooding the markets driven by subsidies and many Indian manufacturers they stopped producing our own pencil in G and we got dependent on the Chinese imports of the APIs. Even today even today uh, the maximum number of the APIs that India is using we are importing it from China and, uh, and also remember you may have this question coming in the, from this form as well penicillin G NT uh, as an API used to manufacture what type of vaccine or what type of medicine. So, at least remember the connection penicillin G has a connection with the antibiotics also. So, that also you need to remember brings us to the next question number 33 very straightforward question again. So, it says the question is about the Yonde declaration Yonde declaration relates to what it relates to elimination of malaria related death. So, basically Yonde declaration is all, uh, uh, that has its relation to Africa. Africa Yonde is a, is a capital of Cameroon there is a country called Cameroon. So, uh, it is it is very important that we should be talking about it. So, it is not about uh, African Union joining G20 not about illegal migration to Africa massive afforestation program now but again this this question was not easy remember these kind of questions are very tricky this is only good for those students who have read about it otherwise it's it's a nightmare because look at like how would you even if you even let's say let's for let's say if you know it's a capital of Cameroon there are there are many questions that again relates to Africa right so if there is always high chances of confusion so I would say this question was a medium level question but be careful while taking a risk or if you have not read in it in your current affairs then better to skip if you go for the uh, if you go for the elimination or you go for blind uh, guess guesswork there are 75 percent chances you are going to go wrong. So, be very careful because even by understanding the Yaoundé as a capital of Cameroon there are many options including Africa in it. But in reality what is this Re in reality what has happened the health ministers from 11 African nations 11 health ministers from 11 African countries they declared to eliminate malaria related death in their countries and this this decision of these 11 uh, African nations is known as Yonde declaration Yonde being the capital of Cameroon like I told you. Why it is so important <clears throat> because Africa is one such continent having because Africa is considered as the epicenter of malaria cases ra? really I mean in Africa malaria is still a big nightmare. In fact, just alone in Africa 94 percent of all global malaria cases are in Africa alone. 95 percent of the global malaria related deaths they are happening in Africa alone and imagine just in 2022 5,80,000 people died in Africa just because of malaria. So, that makes sense why this Yonde declaration is so important for the people of Africa. The next question number 534 the vocal for local initiative. Now, this is a very important and interesting question, but be careful the question is which statement is not correct. So, be very careful about it. What is this local for uh, vocal for local initiative? See when I just apply a common sense 
if i'm if i'm saying a local local initiative means i'm clearly i i'm interested in boosting up the local products of our country and vocal for local is a program started by niti aayog that actually encourages the people to support and promote the locally produced goods and services rather than depending on the foreign brands you are supposed to promote your own products your home made product your domestic products your local and supporting the local economy this local vocal for local initiative aims to promote the grassroots level entrepreneurship and also making india more self reliant more atmanirbhar because if you are supporting your own manufacturers of course at in the long run your manufacturers would be giving you everything that you want you you will not be uh, any more dependent on the imports right that is important now very interestingly this vocal for local initiative involves mapping and consolidating local products from the 500 aspirational blocks under one particular brand called akanksha brand so please understand all these local products they are put under the umbrella brand called akanksha brand why do we need that so let's say tomorrow tomorrow if you really plan to export your product your local product for exporting you need to have a brand no and the government has given that brand as akanksha akanksha is a umbrella brand with potential for international market also because for international market you really you really have to brand your product then only it will be exported and can be promoted globally but please remember this important fact so right now 500 aspirational blocks are majorly focused so that so as to improve grassroots level entrepreneurship in those 500 aspiration block not the complete india not a pan india kind of thing right that is important guys so these small small facts are important now you may ask me sir tell us more about the aspirational pro block program so for that you have to go to 2018 in 2018 the government of india started aspirational blocks program including 112 districts nationwide out of out of say uh, more than 760 districts 112 districts were focused under the aspirational block program it it follows the model of aspirational district program these aspirational districts are the most backward districts these most backward districts are separated or segregated because we really want to focus on those who are left behind in the race and that's why because focusing alone and separately on the backward uh, districts we really want to bring development into that so what is this what, what are the goals of the uh, aspirational block program enhancing the performance of underdeveloped blocks in various aspects and under such category majorly these blocks are coming from states like up bihar madhya pradesh jharkhand odisha west bengal and there you have mostly these districts which are which are still aspirational which still want to develop themselves so how many statements are not correct here sir first statement is absolutely correct the third is correct the second statement is also correct but the question be careful the question says which statement is not correct so answer has to be none the question was a medium level question i'm very sure you could have taken little bit of risk because see the word vocal for local actually makes you uh at least understand the statement number 2 this can be easily related to this one initiative you may have this number number may be a problem and maybe you are not sure that which particular uh, organization has initiated the program because because knowing the the nodal ministry or the organization under which the program is started is really important so it is it's a more of a fact based kind of thing uh take a risk but depending on how much you know about it if you if you say sir this is absolutely going over my head then again you have to skip it all together but try to get the elimination technique into this one particular thing question number 35 straight away question straight forward question operation insaniyat relates to which of the following sir is it humanitarian aid for the people of palestine no people of gaza no is it about something related to ukraine region no operation insaniyat is something which india launched to help bangladesh 
to overcome the humanitarian crisis due to the large influx of Myanmar refugees. So right answer has to be A, straightforward, easy question. You should know a little bit more about Operation Insania. So basically what has happened, the Ministry of External Affairs of India launched this Operation Insania, helping Bangladesh. You know, there was a time, the, uh, 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 there was a time when due to military crackdown in the Rakhine state of uh, Myanmar, Lacks and lacks of Rohingya Muslims, they fled from Myanmar and majority of them, 90% of them came to Bangladesh as a, as, a, as a refugees. And that time, Bangladesh was under huge pressure how to take care of these large influx of, of uh, people coming from Myanmar. Now, to, su to supplement the carrying capacity of Rohingya Muslims, India started the operation in Sanya and that's, that's where we helped Bangladesh to overcome the humanitarian crisis. How did we do that? India provided all basic items for, for those uh, uh, people coming from Myanmar so that Bangladesh alone does not have to, you know, take all the burden on itself. So India gave everything right from the people, right from the moment the people came to Bangladesh, we gave them pulses, rice, sugar, salt, cooking oil, biscuit, mosquito net, ready to eat noodles and lot more. And that's why when you think of insaniyat, you think of humanitarian aid, you think of India. India has done some amazing works like that. And that's why when it comes to soft power, India is absolutely a champion, no? So, but please remember the operation insaniyat. Uh, it has its a humanitarian cause and that associates with Bangladesh. Next question is a typical question. Why? The question is about the National uh, Register of Citizen called the NRC and the NPR, the National Population Register. Are they same? Of course not. NRC, NPR are not same. They are different. They have different impacts. The process is different. So with respect to the two, you are supposed to figure out the right statement and this NRC and NPR are the two things which are in news always. Every time election comes in India, uh, political parties start talking about NRC and NPR. Why? What is, what is all that? First, let's talk about the National Register of Citizens, the NRC. The NRC is actually a register for all Indian citizens and it was created, it was, it was cre its creation was mandated by 2003 amendment to the Citizenship Amendment Act 1955. Under the same Citizenship Act, but after 2003 amendment, the NRC was actually created. And every Indian citizen needs to be registered in the NRC. The purpose was simple. What is the purpose of NRC, sir? Purpose is to document all legal citizens of India. I mean, there are, there are crores and crores people living in every pocket of India. How do we know who is actually the citizen, legal citizen of India or you are an illegal migrant? Considering the porous borders of India, you really have to take a check on the illegal immigrants. No? So NRC's purpose was simple, to document who which of the following are the legal citizens of India so that illegal immigrants can be identified and if required can be deported back. This was supposed to be pan-India exercise but so far, it was implemented only in the state of Assam from 2013 to 14. Only once, only once the NRC was done, right? But for the rest of the India, it is still yet to be implemented. It has not yet implemented. This was the story of NRC. What is NPR? National Population Register. Now, NPR is prepared under Citizenship Act 1955. Again, the same Citizenship Act. So both have one common base, but, but this is a database, NPR is a database having a list of all usual residents of the country. There's a difference guys. The NRC was talking about the legal citizens of India. This was the keyword, legal citizen of India. It says the usual residents of India, usual resident means who? The word usual resident means any anybody anybody or any person who is residing at a place for the last six months or intends to reside there for another six months becomes a usual resident and this npr 
the usual resident term includes the Indian citizens. It can also include the foreign citizens as well. If there is any foreigner, any US, UK guy living in India for the six months becomes usual resident or intends to be there for India next six months becomes a usual resident. So he is not a citizen of India. That's why NRC is about the legal citizens of India and NPR is a record of the usual residents of, of the country. So any, anybody become a usual resident without any citizenship issue, right? And it, it was first time, for the first time NPR was collected 2010, it was updated 2015 and it already has details of 109 crore residents. That is the detail that we have so far. So please remember these two very basic difference of NRC and NPR, absolutely important. Now, you must know one more thing as a citizen of India. It's mandatory for every usual resident of India to actually register with the NPR. Are you registered with NPR or not? Check out with your parents. So after NPR is created, nationwide NRC could verify the citizens and that's the process. First NPR will happen, then NRC will happen. And that is, that is something the BGP government always says, understand the chronology from NPR will go to the NRC. But please remember one thing, unlike the NRC, NPR is not a citizenship amelioration drive, not at all. We just have learned NPR is not about the citizenship, it's about the usual residents. Because we have just understood and NPR cons uh, consists of foreigners as well. It records the foreigners staying locally for more than six months. So clearly the NRC is very truly about the citizenship amelioration drive. NPR is not that, it's just a database of anybody residing in India for the six months or the next six months, right? Now, clearly, if you have understood all points with me, so clearly you know first, second and third are correct. But the problem is that you can't say that NPR and NRC both are citizenship amelioration drive. NPR is not. So clearly here, how many statements are correct? Only one. Now, medium level question because NRC and NPR are very common questions. In fact, the first and second and third statements are very obvious straightforward. So I do not see any problem in that. It's a very easily attemptable question despite level being little bit medium. You may have, you may take some of the time, but it's quite easy to solve this kind of question. That brings us to the question number 37. The question is about the zero food children. So how many statements are correct with respect to zero food children guys? So what is, what is zero chi food child? Now this is a very serious issue and it's very serious condition guys. So first we need to understand the concept like, like what is this zero food children and whom do we refer as zero food children? That is very important. So recently India's prevalence of zero food children is comparable to the level of West African nations of Guinea, Benin, Lib Liberia and Mali. Means the status of children in India, what is the first understand what is a zero child, zero food child. Zero food child is a very alarming situation. Zero food children means children between 6 to 23 months of their age who have not consumed any animal milk, formula milk, semi-solid food in the last 24 years. If you are between 6 months to 2 years of your age and you have not consumed in the last 24 years anything, you do not have anything to eat, becomes a zero food children. And this category is important because breastfeeding is only for the first 6 months. So literally the, the children's health and nutrition depends what they eat after 6 months. And remember in this particular way, India is comparable to the West African nations where it's obviously very prevalent stage of malnutrition and things like that. And India's, India's level are now comparable to the African countries. It's an alarming situation. In fact, South Asia today has the highest prevalence of the zero food children with almost 8 million, 80 lakh children are under the stage of this in, in South Asia alone. And out of that 8 million, 6.7 million are from India alone. Look at the alarming situation guys. Look at the alarming situation of South Asia and India very particularly. 
so and and it's not like peep that 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 in the world there are some countries who are having the lowest prevalence also look at for example look at latin america latin america caribbean countries they have the lowest prevalence of this kind of thing where zero food children is just just 1.9% in fact even east asia and pacific had the second low, lowest prevalence with 2.9% but look at india look at south asia so two things you need to remember one the the statistics about this and two the definition definition is absolutely important that is the zero food children right okay now also remember one more thing that recently the study estimated india's prevalence of zero food children to be at 19.3% this is the third highest in the world so as as per the percentage it is only guinea and mali who are above india in terms of having more percentage of zero food children guinea 22% approximately mali 20.5 and in india's the zero food children are 19.3 percentage it's not pakistan not bangladesh in fact they are doing pretty well in bangladesh the number is just 5.6 percent pakistan 9.2 percent but look at india 19.3 percent huge absolutely huge so if you go back to the question sir you now again this question is a very pure fact based question logic is there but again the definition the fact each and everything is important so be very very careful i would say this was a tough question why you really have to be careful of each and every fact which was there in the question for example starting from the first statement zero food children look at the age age is fine age is perfect right yes sir first is true but second is not true we just have learned no it's not the west asia having the prevalence of zero food children and always remember west asia is way more developed than south asia of all the asian countries south asia is actually the poorest the backward of all the west asia central asia east asia southeast asia south asia you are always going to see it as at a at a backward stage so even logically if you think west asia having gulf countries and all they are not having that problem of zero food children or something south asia is actually having more problem and there's a reason behind it because south asia is having so many problems one major reason is the population guys the population is a big problem because thanks to bangladesh india and pakistan and that's why logically also west asia could not be worse than south asia okay now yeah i understand i understand the third statement looks correct but now you know you know the answer india's percentage is fine but in india zero food children the third highest is there but not after bangladesh or pakistan after guinea and mali so third is factually incorrect so you could have taken a risk by at least understanding the first two statements understanding the first two a uh, question was definitely of a tough level so only and only only one statement is correct second and third being incorrect so answer is only one clear now that brings us to the question number 38 sir the so question number 38 is is about the right of person with disabilities again this is a very important question and having some important facts so uh, you think of person with disability think about accessible india campaign accessible india campaign it's a nationwide flagship program uh, that is under ministry of social justice and empowerment this accessible india is in hindi it is called the sugamya bharat abhiyan so this one campaign talks about creating barrier free conducive environment for divyangs all over the country that is the that is the way like for every person with disability there should not be any barrier uh, while accessing any public infrastructure and to make sure to have this inclusive development we we have we have we have started the accessible india campaign way back in 2015 and, and and under it 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 is mandatory for every public building to have a separate ramp for for person with disability to have to have all facilities separately available for person with disability if you go to any any uh, public place you have three kind three types of toilets no the male the female and then separate as a uh, person with disability so that that is happening because of this accessible india campaign please remember one thing 
UPSC always going to trick you with the particular states. So when you think of accessible India campaign, Rajasthan has done really, really well. Rajasthan was recognized as the best state to implement the accessible India campaign. And really, Rajasthan deserves all the praise, right? Unfortunately, there are more than half the states who have not yet followed the rules properly, but Rajasthan has really outshined in this accessible India campaign. And according to this uh, rights of person with disability program, a person with disability is someone who has long term impairment. It can be physical, mental, intellectual or sensor abilities. A number of disability categories has, has actually increased from 7 to 11 because, so as to give more right to more people. Earlier only 7 types of disabilities were considered. Now after the recent amendments, now 21 types of disabilities are taken into account so as to give more benefits to more people, right? And, and you have this whole list, you can read about it, there's a whole list, but the numbers are important. So right now 21 type of disabilities are considered for the benefits of right for the person with disabilities. Also one more thing guys, uh, it, is, it is important for you to know that rights for person with disability act gives very important thing when it comes to reservation for the person with disabilities. As per this act, not less than 5% reservation should be done for higher education of the person with disability. And even while going for the government jobs, not less than 4% reservation to be done for the jobs. So you see, not less than 5% reservation for higher education and not less than 4 for the jobs that is mandatory under the right of person with disability act. In fact, Chhattisgarh has uh, really deserves praise here. Chhattisgarh made the presence of a person with disability mandatory even in all the panchayats. So Chhattisgarh has actually uh, got into the local uh, governance. Chhattisgarh has made compulsory for every gram panchayat there has to be person with disability has to be a member of that. And really that, that you know deserves all the praise. So Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, they are some outstanding examples when it comes to these kind of things. So everything is perfect in this in this question. The only problem is statement number two. We, you just have learned who is the best state when it comes to implementation of accessible India, not Tamil Nadu, but Rajasthan. Okay. Now again, you can't guess it. For, for this fact, you have to be aware of the fact. And similarly, it is everything like this 2016 act, how many number of disabilities are there? What is the percentage of reservation? Really, it's a very, very factual question. Right now, 1, 3 and 4 are correct. But again, you really have to be careful. The level of the question is medium level. But will you take a risk or will you skip it altogether? Depend on how many you know. It's a heavily fact driven question. So be really careful about it. Uh, you, without these small, small facts, you can't solve this question. So here only three are correct. But again, Read about these kind of program, read about the social justice programs, lot of questions can come on that in many, many questions. Question number 39, that this question talks about the insurance strategy. What is this insurance strategy which was in news recently? Is it about Ukraine military tactics? No, not at all. Is it to counter for Taiwan defending China's? It is not that as well. So this strategy is an initiative aimed at advancing the rights and well-being of the person with disabilities in India Pacific region. Again, this strategy has a relation with person with disability. So now in this test, I, we gave you two questions with respect to person with disabilities. And this strategy, again, talks about the rights and well-being of the person with disability, but not locally, but at a global level. So this Incheon is actually a, it's a city in South Korea. So inspired from the strategies of South Korea city, we got this insurance strategy that gives, uh, that talks about the right and well-being of the person with disability of all Asia Pacific region. So straightforward question, A, easy, very easy to be, to attempt this question. And even if you're not, you're not comfortable with the right answer, you could have eliminated also because you know, these uh, Ukraine and uh, Taiwan things are quite new. And if something was there in the news, you must have read about it. So basically, the strategy talks about make the right real. Make the right real in what sense? Make the right real for whom? 
for person with disability asia pacific it's an initiative that aims at advancing the rights well being now the strategy is named after incheon south korea where the government of economic social commission of asia pacific region actually gathered uh, in 2012 and in 2012 at this place all the rules and regulations and all the framework was was actually made uh, available and based on every result of this meeting from 2023 to 2000 uh, uh, 2013 to 2022 the efforts were made to give rights uh, to the people with disabilities and because the the concept the whole framework started from this place that's why the name is called the inshon strategy i hope that is clear to everyone brings us to the last question very easy straight forward question basic knowledge the question says which statement is correct the first statement says carbon dioxide is much shorter lifetime than methane but much more efficient trapping radiation obviously not we know it very well we know about the greenhouse gases guys the greenhouse gases the basic greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide no and every other greenhouse gas we always we always compare the global warming potential of any other gas than carbon dioxide we always take carbon dioxide as a base as a benchmark and we compare from from carbon dioxide we compare the other global warming gases so clearly carbon dioxide is, is not short term gas methane is of shorter lifetime but much more efficient for trapping the gases so read about it please carefully and always remember carbon dioxide is a base so every greenhouse gas is going to be above that level not below that level so methane much much shorter life span but when it comes to trapping heat it's absolutely insane in fact methane is 86% 86 times stronger than carbon dioxide when it comes to the warming effect in the last 100 years methane was 28 times stronger but last 20 years the effectivity has really increased so methane despite being available for shorter time in the atmosphere still has very dangerous effect in fact it is said that methane responsible for 30% of the total warming since industrial revolution and it is a second largest contributor of global warming after carbon dioxide so these two things are very very important for you so clearly the first statement is not correct guys uh, the second statement is correct and first can be resolved with a very common sense we know we at least we know these two uh, greenhouse gases we know about the relation of the two na so only second is correct very easy straight away could have been attempted so these were the next 20 questions i really hope guys you have enjoyed the video you really have learned something new from this video and if you did then do not forget to share this video and give us a like uh, uh, give, give us your like and let us know your feedback in the comment section box See you guys in the part number 3 very very soon till then stay happy smile all the way and prepare well for your UPSC exam take care god bless you jai hind jai bharat